Hey guys, welcome to Vintage Online. My name is Rachel and I'm one of our V Kids leaders. And we are so excited that you came to worship with us today, especially if you're new to Vintage. We consider you a VIP and we'd love to connect with you and send you a gift. So just like this video, leave a comment or text the number on your screen to let us know you're here. Another great way to connect is by joining one of our V groups. And you can find out more about that just by going to our website for additional information. Today is Father's Day, so we just wanna give a very big shout out and happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. We hope you feel honored and appreciated today. Thanks again for joining us. Let's go ahead and worship Jesus together. Well, hello church, how y'all doing? How y'all doing church? Come on, stand to your feet. Listen, before we start any lyric of a song, can we take about 10 seconds to give God praise for his goodness, the fact that we're here tonight, the fact that he's blessed us, the fact that we're living. Come on, we have reasons. We have reasons to give God glory. So, Father, we come to sing of your goodness. We come to sing of your love. Father, we just love you on tonight, and we give you glory. Come on, y'all. We song we all go together. We can sing it together. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on.
a place. There is a place that I love to dwell. That I love to dwell. Where it is, church? Is the presence of our Father. All the host, all the host of heaven. Come on, what are they doing? Worshiping. Come on, bowing down. Bowing down before Him. Come on, one for your church. Come on, see, yeah. see. There is a place. There Come on, there. I love to wait. Welcome back, Vintage Church. Yeah, yeah. 
Man, I am so excited for those of you who are in the room, for those of you that are watching this. We are so excited to be back. If I've never met you before, my name is Dustin Turner. I serve as the lead pastor of Vintage Church, and it is so good to be back and to see so many of you guys and to see your faces. I'm not going to lie to you, I kind of got tired preaching to a camera and Chris Wilson, our media arts director, being behind that camera, you know? The one-person audience uh, gets old real quick, although he's very affirming throughout. Um, so, I'm so excited to be back. Listen, I, I want to share with you, uh, as, as we get back, I, I want you to know how incredible of a team of leaders and staff and volunteers that we have at Vintage Church. I mean, they have gone uh, above and beyond to make sure not only that not only that the last three months we've been able to still have something that is church, but also for us to be able to come back together uh, and continue to do streaming online. And so I'm just so thankful for all of our leaders, the people that are a part of our staff, but even a lot of our, uh, our lay volunteers that don't get paid a dime for the amount of time and energy that they've put in to make Vintage Church Vintage Church. And so thank you to all of you um, that lead and volunteer in some way. We're continuing our series uh, in the book of Hebrews, Can't Stop, Won't Stop. And one of the reasons that I love the book of Hebrews so much is because part of what the author of Hebrews is getting at is he's getting at the fundamentals. He's, he's telling the audience that he's writing to, don't forget the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus. The, the audience, the, the people that this author was writing to were considering walking away from Jesus, going back to Judaism, what they had come from, because they thought that would be a little bit easier. But the entire book of Hebrews is written to remind us of the significance of Jesus Christ, of how important he is, how better he is than anything else this world could give us. And that's why we can't stop. Oh man, I've missed that too. We can't stop, we won't stop. And so I want to encourage you, if you've missed any of this series or you just want to go back, if you go on our new website, vcmvmt.com, you're going to find all of the resources from this series. Last week, we looked at the end of Hebrews 9 and we looked at this truth. Jesus died in our place for our sin, suffering our punishment. This week we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. And one of the things that I've been thinking about, obviously, with everything going on in our world, in our culture regarding racism, I mean, obviously that's something that's been on not only my mind, it's been on your mind probably. And I've thought about this in light of the book of Hebrews, and it's this reality that if we've learned anything recently, it's that after 400 years plus, racism is still a problem in our, in our world. I mean, that's crazy, right? That's, that should be shocking to us. That after 400 years, we've not been able to fix the problem of racism. I think one of the reasons is because the sin of racism is just as much spiritual as it is anything else. And one of the things that we're going to see in Hebrews 10 is we're going to see how hearts must be changed and systems of evil destroyed. That's, that's part of the answer to ending racism in our world, to ending any sort of prejudice. And, and what I want you to see in Hebrews 10 today is this reality that at the core we want something to change. And, and the author of Hebrews was reminding his audience, listen, you changed. Something new came to you. Things that were are now different and they're new. And the reason that they are new is because of Jesus and how you turned to Jesus. So what do you do when your solution that you've been performing isn't working. And that's what the author of Hebrews gets at. And so let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, starting in just verses 1 
through 4. He says this, he says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The first truth that I want us to wrap our minds around is this truth. The old sacrifices cannot provide perfect holiness. Don't forget the the audience, they're Jewish. They have a Jewish background. So they understand who their God is, that God is perfect and holy and majestic. And so they recognize that they, if they are going to be in relationship with God, have to be holy. But what the author wants them to see is that the old sacrifices, the old way of Judaism, wasn't going to make them holy. It couldn't do that. And part of what the author is getting at is, listen, don't forget that these sacrifices were offered regularly, on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a yearly basis. But they were also a shadow of the good things to come. The author is, what he's getting at is this this sacrificial system was meant to foreshadow, to look forward to something that was better. The Old Testament, the law, the sacrifices was a past witness of a future reality. The old points forward to the new. Recently, I've, I've been uh, riding bikes with, with my son Gabe, and, and he still has his training wheels on, and that's an okay thing, right? He's learning how to ride his bike, but here's the reality. Sooner or later, you want to take the training wheels off, Right? I mean, sooner or later, I want Gabe to be able to ride his bike without his training wheels. But training wheels are good for the time being. And what the author is reminding us of is that reality, that the old was good for a time, but it wasn't meant to last forever. The point was to look forward to something better and to something greater. So why is the old just a shadow? What's the problem with the old? The author gets at, I think, these three realities. Number one, sin was present. The issue with the old is it didn't do what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to remove the sins of the people. It was supposed to make the people who worship a perfect and holy God holy. But it didn't do that. Because sin was still present, number two, sin was producing guilt. The people of Israel lived with the guilt of their sin, and their, because their sin wasn't being removed, they had to deal with that. And then lastly, because sin was present, ultimately sin wasn't removed to begin with. And what that means is trying to worship a holy and perfect God as broken and sinful people isn't able to happen. You see, the old could not take away the problem. It couldn't deal with the sin that was separating the people from their God. I think the truth that the author is trying to get at in this in this specific section of Scripture. But listen, you could read the entire book of Hebrews and get this point of application. The point is this. Don't go back to what didn't work. Don't go back to what didn't work. For the people of this audience, the the people of Israel, what the author is reminding them is, listen, as comfortable... As much as the old system makes sense, as much as you used to practice that religion, it doesn't work. So why would you go back to it? Now, for most of us, we aren't from Jewish descent. We didn't practice Judaism. And so we're not thinking, hey, I don't have to work. 
I'm not going to go back to Judaism. I've never been there before, right? But every single one of us comes from something that separated us from God. Whether it's a sin that you struggle with, it was a habitual sin, or maybe it was another religion, or maybe you just could care less about God. And what the author of Hebrews wants to remind us is, listen, whatever you came from, don't go back. Because Jesus is so much better. Why go back to a bad thing when you have the very best thing? So if the old is a shadow, what is it pointing to? What is it foreshadowing? Let's look at verses 5 through 13 in Hebrews 10. The author says this, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Verse 8, when he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be, a, she should be made a footstool for his feet the old sacrifices couldn't produce perfect holiness and so jesus new sacrifice replaced the old sacrifice jesus new sacrifice replaced the old sacrifice if you look in your bibles and you see verses five through seven are kind of indented it's because the author is quoting a Psalm. He's quoting Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8. Now, at least from the Gospels, Jesus actually never said these words. But he says that Jesus said them. And the reason he says that is because this psalm was a psalm of David. Now, if you know anything about the Old Testament into the New Testament, Jesus was the Davidic king. He was the Messiah. He was coming from the lineage of David. And so what the author is getting at is that this is a messianic psalm, that Jesus would have said something like this. It's also eschatological, meaning it's coming toward the end. It's getting toward what God was intending all along. And the point of using this psalm is this reality. God's desire has never been about only the physical, but the spiritual. We talked about that reality, that truth, a few weeks ago. That From the very beginning, right? Look at verse 5. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired. Verse 6. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you take no pleasure. The point has never been for it to be about the physical. It's always been about the spiritual. And then he goes on to this reality. God's will was not for Jesus to offer sacrifices, but to offer himself. Not to be a regular priest doing what all the priests had already done, but to offer himself as a one and single sacrifice so the question that we have to ask from this is why did jesus's new sacrifice replace the old sacrifice and this is a this is an argument that the author of hebrews is making over and over and over again to us 
The truth is this, the old sacrifices, regardless of how often they were offered, did not remove sin. I was telling you about Gabe's bike and his training wheels. Well, what I didn't tell you is that just the other week I broke his bike. So he wanted me to get on it and ride it. Well, this is a bike for like a six to nine year old, you know, I'm 34 so there's some, you know, obvious disadvantages. And so I get on the bike, I put my feet on the pedals, and one of the pedals falls off. <laughs> my, my foot does not weigh that much, right? And I start to look at it, and I, I recognize that on the bar where the pedal goes in, the threads are stripped. And I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I go inside, I get on the computer, I look to see if I can find parts. I can't find parts anywhere. The manufacturer doesn't have parts on their website. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So I go back outside and I try to put the pedal on. And I turn and I turn, I, pu- I apply pressure and I turn harder. I put it on the other side just to make sure that the pedal works and it fits on just fine on the other side. So I go back and I try to put it on again and again and again. And here's the reality, it's not going to go on. The threads are broke, it's got to be rethreaded. A- and that's the point that this author is making. Like, there's no reason to keep trying to do something that's not working. And what they're getting at is, listen, Jesus came and replaced the old because the old wasn't working. You're wasting your time trying to fix something that can't be fixed. And that's what Jesus has come to do for us. Jesus' single sacrifice did what the old could not do. It removed sin. That's, That's the picture of the gospel, right? That's the story of the gospel. That Jesus came as a perfect person, born of a virgin, both fully human and fully God. And he lived a perfect life and he went to the cross and died for our sins three days later, resurrecting from the grave. That's why he could remove our sin. He did something that the priests could never do. It's the gospel. His single sacrifice removed sin. And then we see this reality at the end of verses 12 and 13. We know that his single sacrifice worked because what did he do? He didn't continue to work. He didn't continue to go into the temple and provide sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. He finished his work and he sat down at the right hand of God. Which meant it was finished. The work was over. His sacrifice replaced the old. The application for us is not only that we shouldn't go back to what's not working, but if Jesus' sacrifice works, then it means we trust in the sacrifice of Jesus. For some of us, that means we don't keep trying to figure out what's not working or what is working when we know the solution. Like if you're like me and you recognize you have a problem and you keep trying to do the same thing over and over and over again to fix your problem, guess what? You ain't going to fix it. Because the what you've been doing or the way that you've been going about it or your solution isn't the solution to your problem. I mean, how many of us are, are struggling or we're unhappy or we don't have joy and, and we're trying to figure out all of these solutions when at the end of the day, for many of us, the issue is we have a broken heart, a separated relationship from God. And the only answer to find the true lasting joy that we want in life is right in front of us in the person of Jesus. And what the author is reminding us, that's the sacrifice we need to trust in. Trusting is, it looks like repenting of our sins. When you recognize that you've been going one way and it's the opposite way you're supposed to go. Repentance is changing your mind, changing your direction and turning away from that. And then in faith, trusting in Jesus, looking at his death and his resurrection and saying that is what can save me. That is what can make me right with God. The author, that's what he's getting at. 
So don't go back to the old. Trust the new. Trust Jesus. But what's the point he's ultimately getting to? Let's look at verses 14 through 18. He says, For by a single offering he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, he's quoting Jeremiah 31, verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. What's the issue? The sin wasn't being removed. What does God promise? That he'll remember their sins no more. Look at verse 18. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. I think the ultimate point that the author wants to make is that the new sacrifice, the sacrifice that Jesus offers, provides perfect holiness. Remember, what are we trying to do? We're trying to be in right relationship with God, our Creator. God is perfect. God is holy. We're not. And if that sacrifice doesn't produce holiness within us, then it doesn't work. But the new sacrifice provides the holiness. This new sacrifice is the fulfillment of God's promise. That's why he quotes Jeremiah 31. Look at, look at Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. I just want to highlight a few key words and phrases. The prophet says this, The days are coming, declares the Lord, God is speaking through Jeremiah, when I will make a what? New covenant. There's an old covenant. Now there's a new covenant. I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by their hand to lead them out of Egypt. Why? Because they broke my covenant. They weren't holy. Though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Verse 33, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. You see, the new covenant is the answer to the original problem. The original problem of, of being sinful and broken and separated from God, the old covenant could not fix that. It was the new covenant. The death and the resurrection of Jesus that satisfied the wrath of God by removing our sins. That's exactly what he gets at when he says, for by a single sacrifice, he, that is Jesus, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. If you get anything, I want you to get this statement. Write this one down. Christ's perfect sacrifice has provided a perfect holiness. Christ's perfect sacrifice has provided a perfect, perfect holiness when the author talks about the idea of being perfected for by a single sacrifice he has perfected for all time that idea of perfected number one it's in the perfect tense in the original language now for those of you that hate grammar just this is why this is important grammar here shows us that it's a past action with present realities and so what the author is getting at is that the death of Jesus on the cross happened in the past, but right now, 2,000 years later, it's changing us. It's making us holy. 
It's perfecting us. And the idea is not being perfect, meaning not making mistakes or not having blemishes, but it means being whole or bringing to completion. And so the idea here is that God is doing a work in you to make you into the person he wants you to be in the end. And the reason he can do that is because of the perfect sacrifice that Jesus offered 2,000 years ago. He's perfecting you. And he's perfecting for all time those who are being sanctified. It means our sins are cleansed and removed. It means our consciences are free of guilt. It means now we can approach God freely and boldly. The application here, I think, is is this reality that we should be assured of our forgiveness. One of the things I've, I've been thinking about with the book of Hebrews is how many of us as Christians today, walk around with guilt that weighs us down. And I think one of the things that the author is is trying to tell us is we shouldn't be living with that kind of guilt. That in Christ, his death and his resurrection has paid for our sins. Not only should we have assurance that we have been forgiven, but because of that assurance, it should lead us to a place where we're living freely before the Lord and for, before others. If, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, and you're struggling with guilt, ask yourself why. Why? If it's because you're in sin, maybe... It's time to repent of that sin and turn back toward Jesus who provided that perfect holiness for you. Maybe you're not resting in this reality that God has forgiven you in Jesus. You can't forgive yourselves. Others can't forgive you. But you need to be reminded that in Christ, God has forgiven you. And you can be assured of forgiveness. The new sacrifice has provided the holiness we've been looking for. And because of that, we can be assured of our forgiveness. Christ's perfect sacrifice has provided a perfect holiness. Christ's perfect sacrifice has provided a perfect holiness. Go back to what I said at the very beginning about everything going on in our world regarding racism and everything. We're going to address a lot of that. If you haven't seen, we have these conversations that we've been doing. Those are on our YouTube page. In In a few weeks, we're getting ready to go through a study called Undivided in our V groups. We're going to be preaching on racism in the coming weeks. But I think, about, I think about this text in light of everything going on. And I don't want to simplify it because I recognize it's complex and there's so much to it. But I think at the base and foundation of everything going on in our world is this reality. That Christ in his perfect sacrifice has provided a perfect holiness. Jesus was the solution to whatever was going on in the life of these Christians. And regardless of the issue, whether it's racism, whether it's a personal sin, whether it's a broken relationship, whether you're looking at your life right now and recognizing I'm far from God, you need to be reminded that Jesus' perfect sacrifice provides perfect holiness. That at the core, that is the foundation of every answer to every problem. And so for us, 
It's a challenge that we would trust in Jesus now and that we would trust in Jesus forever. I shared it earlier. For some of us, we recognize that there's a chasm between us and God and the solution for that is only found in Jesus. But I think for some of us, we're forgetting, we're forgetting the gospel. Whether it's our own personal sin or it's that guilt we're wrestling with or there's this issue in our life, we're trying to go to let's do this or let's do that, but we fail to recognize the foundation of every issue, the foundation for every solution is found in Jesus. Jesus' perfect sacrifice has provided a perfect holiness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus. Each and every single one of us in this room, each and every single one of us watching this right now are broken, sinful people. We were either at one time separated from you or now in relationship with you, but God, you and your son Jesus are still the answer. So as we respond to you, God, I pray that we would rest in that truth that Jesus' perfect sacrifice provides perfect holiness. So help us now as we respond to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to go into a time of response. If you're watching online, there's a, there's a number on your screen, and, and I want to encourage you that if you need Jesus and you're ready to trust in Jesus, or you just need prayer, or you need to respond in some way, text respond to that number. For those of us in this room, the number is on the screen, and if, if, if tonight's the night and you would say, I'm ready to trust in Jesus, or you would say, I need prayer, or I have questions, Maybe you're struggling with guilt. I want to encourage you, text, respond to that number. We would love to be able to follow up with you and help you take whatever next step you need to take. Whatever that is, let's stand now and let's respond. Amen, church. Let's take a moment just to reflect on a sacrifice. Father, you satisfy. You satisfy. Yes. Oh God, you satisfy. You are our rock, Jesus. You satisfy. My hope is filled. Jesus blood and righteousness. Come on, church, sing it. I dare not trust the sweetest friend. Of what we do, church. We only trust in Jesus' name. Let's do that verse again. Yes. Our hope is built on nothing less. Come on, then what, church?
Bible church, y'all sing it out. Come on. We rest on his unchanging grace. Come on, what else? Come on. With every high and stormy. Come on, y'all. Our anchor, what? What a great time of worship. We want to thank our music arts team for leading us. We are going to continue to respond by giving, and we just want you to know that your generosity is changing lives. There are several ways to give today or throughout the week. Another way to respond is by serving our city. We have updated our Serve NOLA page with information on how you can serve as an individual, a family, or a group during the summer. As we close, may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. And may we be empowered to live the gospel, serve the city, and be the church. Have a great week. <laughs>